everyone. Welcome to Head Talks. This is a great series. I'm just loving this series. And it is what? What are we doing? Yeah, we're doing Kings and Queens of England. And uh, it's just, it's so intricate and detailed. And uh, we're just taking our time getting through this. Um, remember last week, we had to stop. We, got, we only got halfway. Right? Um, so today we are going to touch upon, we're going to touch upon the life of England's greatest king. Do you know who that was? Richard the First. Excellent, Bob. You're very good at this. All right, Richard the Lionheart. All right, he's the greatest king, and that might be surprising. Uh, we'll take a look at his life, and it might be a little bit surprising um, why he would be considered the most loved, the most loved king of England. But before we get to him, uh, we really do have to do a quick review and get to where we left off last week. We didn't even get through Henry last week, remember? Mm -hmm. We got all the way to, to Ireland, and so we have to catch up, and we're going to uh, get there. So last week, we were looking at the reign of Henry II. So we're going to go through quickly what we did and then uh, get ourselves caught up. We couldn't, we couldn't possibly move forward on his story without talking about her story. Who is she? Yes, Eleanor of Aquitaine, exactly. And you might remember, you may recall, hey Peggy, you may recall that um, she is the daughter of the Duke of Aquitaine and he had, didn't have any sons. And so how was she uh, received by her father, do you remember? He adored her, yes, he absolutely adored her. She was the apple of his eye. And so he educated her, right? He educated her in the same way you would educate a son. You probably remember that, right? Yes. And so she had this fantastic education. And in addition to that, he allowed her to be by his side when he conducted business. And so this young girl not only had the education of a son, a noble son, but she was also right there in the room for all of the political intrigue of the day. Do you think this woman was a little savvy? <laughs> she was. She was. She has quite a story. She has really an extraordinary story. You know, last time, um, Effie and I were chatting a little bit afterwards, and we were, we were mentioning how few stories there are about women, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And the reason for that is because women were treated how? Second class. They were, they were property, and yeah. so they really couldn't. And so once in a while, we have these breakout extraordinary women once in a great while. Henry gets two of them. <laughs> How does that happen? He gets two of the few and far in between uh, breakout women. All right, now we know that when Eleanor's father dies, he sets her up for protection because what does she own? What does she become the heir of? Aquitaine. All of Aquitaine. And so ultimately what happens is she marries the king of France, Louis VII. Remember him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we remember him because um, he, was not, uh, he was not that nice to her. He continues to play a part in this story. All right, so they get married and remember... Um, he wasn't really happy with her. The marriage was very, very strained. Um, but he was thrilled with the marriage because he acquires what now? Aquitaine. And we've, yes, exactly, Aquitaine. And it's really important for us to understand that France at the time, this is France at the time in the 12th century, and the king, the king of France rules over 
this much. Do you see? And then the other lands are ruled over by what? Duchies. Dukes. Yeah, the dukes. dukes, yes. Yeah, these are all duchies, and they are ruled over by um, their independent uh, dukes. Now, they do have to pay fealty to the king, but is the king as powerful as the Duke of Aquitaine? No. 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 All right, so would he have a vested interest in acquiring all of this? Yes. Of course, yes. And so last week we had named that whole uh, session Aquitaine because it's really about this piece of land. The whole thing today is about this piece of land. All right, so now he's kind of fed up with her and he wants to get an annulment, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly, Pep, because there's no boys. They have two daughters, and there are no boys, and he, of course, wants boys, right? And so he figures he will get an annulment from her. He can marry somebody else that can produce boys because, of course, it's Eleanor's fault. <laughs> and um, so, that's, so that's what he does. He doesn't believe he's going to lose Aquitaine, because he thinks she's never going to go against me and remarry. She wouldn't do that. That would be very dangerous. She wouldn't do that. And then ultimately, um, he, will, he will receive Aquitaine through his two daughters. You remember that? Uh -huh. All right, but then Eleanor surprises everybody <laughs> by immediately upon receiving that annulment, she dashes through the country on her way to, do you remember where? Henry. To, to what? Because she's going to marry Henry of England. Now, Henry is not the king yet, uh, but she sees, yes, Effie, she sees a lot of, a lot of promise potential. in, yes, a lot of potential in this young man. Plus, she had met him the year before, and I guess she liked what she saw. So she was. Uh, so she she dashed there um, on her way and to marry him. It was about eight weeks, eight <laughs> weeks after the annulment, and that was a real, real, real slap in the face to Louis. He was not happy about that at all. That was an insult. He didn't expect that to happen because the minute she marries Henry, what happens to Aquitaine? Belongs to Henry. Henry. It belongs to Henry, exactly right. Now, shortly after that happens, you remember the treaty, the Treaty of Winchester? I'm sure you remember all of that. Um, yeah, so the treaty said that Stephen would remain king until he died, and then what would happen? Henry becomes king. All right, not his own son, not his son William but Henry, okay? So Henry would become the king, and so when Stephen dies unexpectedly, what happens to Henry's empire? <laughs> oh my gosh. Now in a span of, do you remember? Do you remember? Four years. Four years. He's just Henry, and then all of a sudden within four years, um, he acquires he acquires all of this land, and he's got himself an empire, which is pretty magnificent. Now, not only does he acquire this amazing empire, but he also gets something else that's critically important to any king. Sons. Yes, he gets sons. Now, you remember Henry and Eleanor have eight children, seven survive to adulthood, which is very unusual uh, for, that, for that time period. And how many of those eight children are boys? Four. Four. One, two, three, four, five. Five. All right, now, now we've got, yes, William the oldest, he dies, he's just a toddler. Um, when he does, but the rest of them survive into adulthood. Now, here you've got some incredible luck, right? No, not really, because they have five. 
You've got incredible, if you're Henry II and you've married Eleanor of Aquitaine, and then you've become the King of England, which also means you become the Duke of Normandy. 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 All right, so you've got this huge empire, and then you've got all of these sons, right? Now, what do you think Louis is feeling? He has this annulment, yeah, he, he gets rid of his wife with all the land. He's lost it, because she immediately flies through the country to marry um, he's just outraged. He's absolutely outraged. And then, um, to add insult to injury, she winds up giving birth to all these boys. So he is just completely beside himself angry over this whole situation. And that's going to play a role, of course, um, as we go on. Now, we took a look um, at, we do know a little bit about Henry. He's got red hair, blue eyes, he's medium height, he's intelligent, he's funny, he's got a super bad temper, a very bad temper that plays an important role in his life. He's high energy, remember that? Like he's always uh, walking around, he's always gotta be doing something super high energy, but he's also compassionate, correct? Yes. He's, he's uh, compassionate and he cares about the common people. He really does uh, care about them and he takes steps to protect them. All right, we also know that he chose very well his advisors, so he took his ego out of it in order to have the right people um, counseling him. And one of his most important advisors is who? His mother, yes, and then another one is? Eleanor, and that shows respect for the women, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, because that is unusual that you would have women as advisors. And then there is something called new men. Do you remember what new men is? Yeah. Professional. Certified professional people. Excellent. Yes, because prior, during the reign of Henry I, you remember, he brought in something called new men. And that was actually people that knew what they were doing instead of people that were just born into position. Um, and they probably knew nothing about um, the positions that they held. All right, so one of the new men that was referred to Henry II was a low-born man by the name of Beckett. Beckett, Thomas Beckett. All right, and so he comes into Henry's life and they hit it off right away, right? They become really, really good friends. They are best friends. They um, are actually drinking buddies. They go out carousing together. Um, they're just the absolute best of friends. But of course, Beckett is a commoner, correct? Yes. He's common born. And so would he have an interest in protecting the common people. Yes. yes, of course he does. And so he is in a position with Henry, who also has compassion for the common people, um, to make a difference, and they do. And we now have something called the Common Law of England, and it begins with these, with these people. They want to protect the people working the lands. They don't own the lands. Correct? That's right. And they could be thrown off by the, by the owner f at the owner's whim. All right, the landowner could just toss them off. And so now these protections are set in place so that things like that don't happen. So Henry has a real, he's really into control. He's very, very much in, into uh, controlling these things, all this land is probably overwhelming, and he's devising ways in order to do that. But one place that he cannot touch is what? The church. The church, exactly, John, that's exactly right. He cannot touch the church. The church has its own court system, and at this time in this area, about one in five men were a member of the clergy. So if you commit a crime, you don't go through the royal court, you go through 
the church, church court, and you cannot, you cannot be punished, no matter what the crime is. You could commit murder, mass murder, and the most that you can be punished is to pay a fine. That's it. You will pay a fine. And Henry could not touch that, could not touch that. But he wanted some control over that um, because he wanted to rein in. Remember Stephen was a very weak king? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of lawlessness? Mm -hmm. And Henry's trying to just corral all this and set laws in place. And he was working very hard towards that. And then this was stopping him. So when he had the opportunity, when the archbishop died, he had this great idea of putting his best buddy, who's on the same page with him in everything, into that position, <laughs> all right? So he's got his best friend, Beckett, right? Now what does, he, what, what does his mother and wife say don't to him? Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't do this, don't do this. And normally he, he did listen to his mother and to his wife, but in this one instance, he did not. And that turned out to be um, a fatal, fatal mistake. All right, so Beckett is named Archbishop, all right? He quits his, his position as chancellor under the king because now he no longer has to be under the king and do what the king says. All right, he's going to answer to the Pope and he's going to answer to God. So when that happens to him, the old um, materialistic drinking buddy, uh, wild guy disappears, becomes what? A saint. A saint. A saint. Pious. Yes, he becomes pious. He becomes very pious. And he starts going up against Henry, and the two of them um, butt heads. And this goes on for years, for years. They're fighting. Um, Thomas is not going to do the things that Henry wants him to do. Um, he wants to maintain his power. He's not going to give up power um, the way Henry thought that he would. Now, because the two men had... Um, Con they clashed so often when Henry decides that he would like to name his successor he's just trying to avoid um, trouble that comes from successions and so he he names his eldest now eldest son Henry king but king in waiting so he's the young king Henry that's what he's called young king Henry and of course, that's something that the archbishop would do. He would, he would uh, perform that ceremony. But Henry didn't have Thomas there, did he? No. He went with another uh, bishop and other clergymen. And when Thomas found out that this very important, significant event occurred without him, um, how, what was his reaction? He was angry. He was really, really angry, and what he decided he was going to do was excommunicate everybody. Yeah. All right, so we'll just excommunicate everyone, um, and then Henry has one of his famous tent temper tantrums over this. He has one of his famous temper tantrums over this and he's in the court and he's yelling and screaming, I made him what he is, I raised him up, he was just a low life and I, how long do I have to put up with this guy and he's just sputtering and spouting and his guards thought that they were hearing what? An order, yeah the guards thought they were hearing an order to go get this guy. So they go, yeah, yes, so they go to um, arrest him, and what does Thomas do? He's resisting arrest, and as that struggle is going on, one of the soldiers, um, he swings his blade, and he just slices off the top of Thomas's head. It was very gross. It was described in a real, it's described in great detail. I'll spare you that. All right, so, so that happens in front, in the church at the altar, 
in front of priests who are witnessing this. It is a huge, huge ordeal. And so what does the Catholic Church do right away? They saint him. All right, so now Thomas Beckett, Beckett is going to be sainted um, to kind of appease the people because this was so upsetting, it was so outrageous. Um, that this had happened. Now, how do you think the people are feeling about Henry? No, yes, and so because there's a lot of heat coming down on Henry, he thinks that maybe I should get out of town for a little while and let it all down a little bit and so what he does is a first for any king of England guess where he goes, he goes to the yes he goes, oh, to he goes to Ireland, Ireland. yes now oh. there are a lot of um, chieftains there's a lot of tribal um, conflicts happening and so Henry thinks I'm gonna go there and I am going to settle this area I'm gonna put all this um, down and I'm going to uh, bring peace into this land. And so he's the first king of England that actually goes to Ireland. And he's successful. He does. In fact, he gets quite a bit of Ireland. Here it is right here. So in the blue is now, all right, so now this is a part of England. Interesting, right? Yeah, he's, go he's going to avoid some scandal and he winds up conquering half of Ireland in the process. All right, so, he's, so, he, so he has done that. While he's there in um, Ireland, now remember he's got a family back home, right? Yeah, he's got all those sons, and he's got to deal with all of those sons. And he does. Now, it's important to note here, all right, so we've got Henry, Richard, Joffrey, or Jeffrey, and then John. But look, John's a surprise baby. <laughs> he came much later. They weren't expecting him, all right? So the, the older boys, they're, they're all kind of within the same, you, you know, within a couple of years. He's like 10 years younger. All right, so they were not expecting John. And because they weren't expecting him, Henry, who is a control freak, there's no question about it, he has taken care of allotting lands to his sons, who are the ones who will inherit. And this is how it goes. Young Henry is going to be the King of England, and then he will also be Duke of Normandy. Uh, Richard will be the Duke of Aquitaine, and Joffrey will be the Duke of Brittany. All right, so here we, so here we have the, the land division, okay? And that left nothing for young John. So when he comes along, his father, his father um, kind of jokingly and kind of seriously nicknames him John Lackland. That's his name. That's what he calls him. All right. So it's an endearing term. It's a, you know, it's a loving term. But this really is uh, bothering Henry. He just doesn't have anything left uh, for his youngest son, and he and he's upset about that. John Lackland is what he's called. Now, as he's trying to figure this out, he's thinking. Can I make him king of Ireland, of Dublin? Can I arrange a marriage for him and he can inherit um, something through that? And he's, he's openly discussing how he's going to get some kind of heritage for his youngest son. You know, they say that John was his favorite. John was Henry's favorite. And he really did seem to worry a lot about him. So while he's talking about splitting things up a little bit differently, he does not realize that the older boys are not happy about this. <coughs> the older boys are not good sharers. Mm. They fight each other. 
to. They're not willing to share. It had been divided. You know, it's not our fault. You guys had a baby later on in life. It's not our fault. Why should we? And so, and so um, there is something that's starting to brew. And it starts to brew, and this is going to absolutely blow your mind. When Eleanor goes back to Aquitaine, so she goes back, that's where she was raised, that's her home, her homeland, she takes Richard with her. Richard is her favorite. All right, there are favorites going on here. All right, so Richard is her favorite. She takes Richard with her, and she's back in France. In fact, she's a very forward thinker. Um, this is, she is promoting the whole idea of chivalry and honor. She has something called the school of love. Yes. But, oh, you know about that? Yeah. So what she is teaching in the school of love is valor and chivalry. And so she's ushering in. She's a forerunner of this, um, of this new way of thinking. And so she's got her son, Richard, who's being raised in this. Um, philosophy, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, now her son Henry, you know, Henry the king, we already know he's a control freak, right? And we know that he's named him Henry King in waiting, young Henry King in waiting, but he's not giving him any responsibility. He's not even giving him any kind of source of income. Won't even give him a way to earn income. Here he is a young man, and he's got to go to his father to ask for money. All right, so he's unhappy. Eleanor, when she gets to Aquitaine, she is also a little ticked off because she sees that her land, Aquitaine, pieces of it are being bartered. He's using her land. Um, what? Collateral, thank you, as collateral. And she's not happy about that, is she? Is there anything she can do about it? Yeah. There's, really, there's, nothing, she, there's nothing she can do about it. And so what Eleanor and Henry, and then we've got Richard is just in tow, uh, what they're doing as they're expressing this dissatisfaction, um, it's getting back to, remember Louis? who lost an awful lot. Well, he's there in France, right? He's the king of France. So he reaches out to his ex-wife. He's reaching out to his ex-wife. He wants to help. He wants to be a help in this situation. All right? And he's got the boys come, and they get uh, Joffrey to come down too. John stays with his dad. He's too little to be involved in this, all right? So now we've got Eleanor, and we've got Henry, Richard, and Jeffrey, and they're all there talking to the very sympathetic Louis, King of France. And what's he encouraging them all to do? Revolt, excellent. Revolt against their father. To revolt against their father. Three of his sons, three of his own sons, revolt against him. All right? All right? There is public support for young King Henry because remember the whole Beckett thing? Yeah. All right, so are people feeling good about King Henry? No. They're not. They're not feeling good about him at all. They're furious with him. He's taken off and gone to Ireland, and now this is happening while he's away. There's a lot of public support, and more importantly, the landowner support, the noblemen, the barons are supporting young Henry. So King Henry knows that he's in trouble, and he's got to do something about this, all right? He's got to handle this. And he comes up with this pretty ingenious idea. The thing that's put him behind the eight ball with the public is Beckett, right? Yeah. 
So what he's going to do is he is going to walk barefoot and half naked to Canterbury. And he is going to um, bow down at the, at the tomb of Becket. Here he is, king of the empire, right? He's going to bow down at the tomb of Becket. This is the tomb. This is actually it. Has anyone seen that? No. No. Yeah. All right, so this is the tomb of Thomas Becket. And so he has uh, bowed himself down at the tomb, and the priests are going to flog him. The priests that witnessed the murder are the ones that are going to flog him. And he allows this. When he's there, he's asking forgiveness. He asks his friend Thomas for forgiveness. He's asking God for forgiveness. And he is allowing this public humiliation as a way in hopes of regaining or gaining the forgiveness of the people and regaining their favor. And now, a miracle happens because the very next morning, the very next morning in Scotland, there was a warlord who was terrorizing the north of England, terrorizing them. And the very next morning after Henry was flogged, that warlord was captured and imprisoned effectively bringing an end to those terrorizing skirmishes. So what did the people think? It was a direct yeah. result that he was forgiven. That he was forgiven. Yeah. Yes, they saw it as a sign. Wouldn't it be amazing if Henry had already captured the guy, but didn't leak it out until after the flogging? I'm devious. I'm devious in my thinking, right? I'm thinking. All right, because that was just a little too convenient, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because it was the next morning that they yeah. caught they caught this this terrorist. Okay, so um, so that happens, and what's going on in his empire? In England, in Aquitaine, in Normandy, Anjou, what's happening everywhere? Oh, it looks like it looks like God is with who? Henry. Henry. And so now um, it's shifting away from young Henry. And so what is the king able to do? He is able to round up all of these traitors, right? It's his wife and his kids. Um, but they're traitors. He's able to round them up. And the first thing he's going to do with his wife. He's going to put her in jail. No, no, no. Jail. Puts her in jail. And she's in jail for 16 years. But when we say jail, let me just tell you this. We are not talking dungeon. It's not dungeon. It's more like she's under house arrest and she has contact with her children. It's not, I mean, I mean, it's not great to be under house arrest, but she was but not. It's isolated her. Yes, um, but she's, she's, not, she's not in a dungeon. And can you imagine how irate he must have been with his sons? Mm. Yeah. And what did he do about that? forgave them forgave them he forgave them and he kept um, their inheritance in exactly the way that it was he tried very hard to appease their feelings he tried to give them more money he wasn't just gonna dump a whole bunch of money onto Henry but he gave him more he loosened up a little bit more he did everything that he could that he felt was responsible um, to repair the relationship Isn't that just like a man he, he, he did a job on his wife but he, he didn't do a thing with his sons right yes yes did everyone hear what Effie said he, yeah, he, he was uh, more than happy to forgive his sons, but not the wife. Although, but it was kind of him. She allied herself with her ex-husband, his natural 
arch enemy. I mean, really, that wasn't good. Um, but but still, all right. So he has completely forgiven them, and there is a time of peace. They enter into a time of peace, this family, until tragedy strikes them a few years later, and Joffrey is in um, a jousting tournament. He sustains an injury and later dies from that wound, from that injury. Now, after the tragedy of that, Henry has to take a look at what he's got now, right? Mm. And he has to arrange all the pieces, yes? Yeah, he does. He does. He has to rearrange things, and so he's trying to figure out the most equitable way to divide this among his sons. But again, what does young Henry think is the right thing to do? Don't give John anything. Just the more for me. Yeah. All right? Just the more for me. And so Richard's right there with him as well. And so now there is a second revolt against the father who had forgiven them for the first one. There's a second one. Do you believe this family? No. All right, so, th so now there's a second one. And right here, I'm going to stop for one brief second because I have to let you know that from this point forward, whenever somebody dies, chances are they died of dysentery. I'm going to be saying dysentery over and over and over again from this point forward. And sadly, I'm going to be saying dysentery right now because as this revolt is amping up, the second revolt is amping up, young King Henry dies of dysentery. He dies of dysentery. So even though he was leading a second revolt against his father, his father is quoted as having said, he cost me much, but I wish he had lived to cost me more. Yeah. To be his successor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So now he has died. So he has died. Now Joffrey has died. Henry has died. William had died uh, many years before. This, the, he was only 26, I think. Yeah. Around 26 years old. A lot after 26 years. They did pack a lot into just a little bit of time. I know. It was just crazy. It's crazy. Okay. All right. So now Henry... King Henry is thinking, again, I'm going to have to shuffle things around here again. And so what's going to happen is we've got Richard, who's now the eldest, correct? Yes. And so he will get England, Ireland, Normandy, and John will get Aquitaine. Now that seems fair, doesn't it? Except, originally, Richard was the Duke of Aquitaine, and he's not happy about this. Do you believe this? So Richard is very upset that his father, he's going to get all this, which wasn't in the original plan, right? All this. And then John was going to get this. See, yeah. King Henry the second, he's just like s continuously surprised by his sons. All right, so no, Richard's not going to have that. He's not, um, he's not happy about that at all. And so he's going to make an alliance. Now, Louis has passed away, but his son Philip has taken over. And Philip is just as eager to get some of this English land, isn't he? Yeah. All right, they want to get that, um, that kingdom mm -hmm. uh, to expand some. And so he buddies up with Richard. Of course he does. Yeah. He buddies up with Richard. They team up. Richard and Philip of France go up against Henry. All right? The guy can't win. Henry, the guy, right, yes, Vicky said the guy can't win. 
And at this point, he has been suffering from an ulcer. Uh-oh. All right, he's, been, he's older, um, he's 56, I think, and he's been suffering um, from an ulcer this the whole time, and he's really just, um, he's just done. You know, he's just done. And so what happens is Richard and Philip, uh, they have a, a meeting for a peace treaty, and Henry has to um, hand over some of the land in this, in this um, peace treaty. All right, and so he has, um, and now his ulcer has perforated, and so he knows he's dying. He knows, he knows that he's dying, and so he just wants to go off and die in peace, but his uh, guards come, and he says to the guards, who betrayed me? Who has betrayed me? Because he knew that there were more people involved in this, and the guard had a list of names that they had discovered of the people that betrayed him, and number one on the list, was John. No. His son John. John, who he spent all of John's life trying to get him a piece of land, something, uh, some, some kind of, um, of inheritance. He wants to give him an inheritance. John had gone over to the side of Richard and Philip because John thought they were stronger and that they were going to be the ones in power and betrayed his father. And it said that um, upon hearing the name of his son John, that King Henry died. He said, let it, I'm paraphrasing, um, let it be, let it be as, as it is, let it be as it is. And then he just, he died. And they say that he died of a broken heart. He died of a broken heart. All right, so he dies in 1189. Um, it said that Richard came in, looked at his father, turned, and left. Okay, but it remained that Richard was now what? Yep, so it stayed, it stayed, so he becomes king of England, Ireland, or Dublin, uh, Duke of Normandy, he has the whole, he has the whole empire. The very first thing that Richard is gonna do, I hope you haven't forgotten about Eleanor. No, I, I know he's gonna do it. All right, so she is, so she is released, all right? now. As this is happening, something else really, really big is going on that's going to affect Richard's life, and that is the Third Crusade. The Third Crusade. I have to go fast now. Okay, so the Third Crusade. And do you remember what caused the Third Crusade? This is a big, big, big one. No. Do you remember what caused it? No, nope. no, the capture of Jerusalem. Remember Saladin? Oh, Saladin. Yes, 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 Saladin captures Jerusalem. And we did um, go into this in great detail. I think we took a couple of weeks in our Monday yeah. sessions. We've, we've gone over the Third Crusade um, in great detail. So we won't do it here because it's a huge story. Um, but. But Richard has to go. He has to go. He really can't not go. Not only had his uh, father and brother promised the Pope that they would join a crusade, and they died before they could keep that promise, so he's obligated in that way, correct? Mm -hmm. but, but Saladin has taken, has captured Jerusalem, and that is um, a huge thing he has to follow through with. Do you remember where he was raised? And his mother was 
the leader of the school of what? Exactly. He chivalry and honor and valor. Now he was known as the Lionheart before the Crusade. I don't know if you knew that. He's he was called Lionheart, and why was he called that? Because he led commands at the age of 16. He was 16 years old, and he led commands. He was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant in battle. All right, so he's got to go because he is a great warrior, a great leader. He's obligated through his father and his brother, and he's raised under the code of chivalry. And so he's got to go. He cannot turn away from this. But he's got this empire that was just, has gone through a civil war, right? So he's got to take care of some things before he goes. And he decides he's going to do that in the best way that he can possibly do it. He goes and he's, uh, he goes to England. He's coronated. And he decides, who's he going to put? His mother. Yes, she is going to run things. And then he's got some very capable men um, also that he's going to put in charge, all right? Who does he not put in charge? His brother. His brother. Yeah, you're noticing that his brother John is not there. No. All right, so he's got a couple of problems um, in order for him to go. So he's got, so he's got um, the empire taken care of in this way with leadership, but he's got a couple of problems. Okay, so one is his brother John. He doesn't trust him, does he? Because he has seen his whole life, John just hops on board with whoever is in power. Yes. All right, so he doesn't trust him. If I go away, he's going to come after um, what's mine. So he makes a deal with John, and he says, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you castles, I'm going to give you um, so much money if you stay out of England for three years. He expected to be gone for three years. All right, and so John says, yes. Are we sure about that? No. John says yes. Um, okay, yes, I agree. And now we've got Philip. Now remember, they were friends. These two joined against his father. But if he's gone, wouldn't wouldn't Philip try to start taking over some of Aquitaine and Brittany and all all those lands? Probably. Of course he would. But Richard's okay with that because guess who's going on crusade with him? Philip. Philip. Yes, Philip. There's also uh, Frederick. There's another um, leader going with him, but he died ultimately. And again, we went through the whole Third Crusade in great detail, which we'll do again on the, in the Monday uh, sessions. Uh, now, so Frederick dies, and guess what Philip did once they got there? He left, exactly. He left. So Richard is the only one leading the crusade. He is the only one doing it. And so now he's hearing, um, he's hearing information, intelligence coming back to him that uh, his brother John is undermining him and saying bad things about him. So is Philip. And so Philip is taking some of his lands. And what is John doing? He's trying to take over in England, right? And guess, and guess who John buddies up with? Philip. 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 Because, of course, Philip's not going to use him until he gets what he wants and then stab him in the back. That probably won't happen. No. Um, but, yeah, so John allies himself with Philip. And so what does Richard have to do? He needs to come home. So he's going to rush home. And uh, on en route, he gets blown off course. He gets bl blown off course. He winds up in Austria. Now, um, Richard, <laughs> Richard had the unfortunate occasion to publicly insult the king of Austria. Yeah. So when he arrived in Austria and they found out he was there, he was promptly captured and imprisoned. Yeah. 
put him in prison. So he's in prison. And how, what do you think John's feeling about that? Happy. Woohoo! Yeah. Right? And Philip, yeah, this is great. This is actually fabulous. Except there's another person that we're forgetting about. Oh, Eleanor. Eleanor, mom to the rescue. So mom reigns in her youngest, or she's, she's John's mother too. And so she's, she's got um, John under control. She reigns him in, and then she also pays the ransom. She pays, pays a huge ransom and lets Richard um, out. So Richard, so Richard is out of prison, and he arrives back in England, and what does he got to do? He's got to take everything back that was taken away from him. And of course he's successful. He does do that. So he gets his lands restored, and then he goes down into France, and he's doing the same thing there. He's getting those lands restored to him. He's winning these battles. But he's kind of like still a control freak with a little bit of reckless behavior. There's this little castle, okay? It's a little castle. It really isn't that significant at all. But he's going to besiege this little castle. And when he decides to do that, well, you know, he's just a really tough guy and he doesn't need any armor because it's just not a big castle, right? So he goes in, and one of the archers with a crossbow shoots him and gets him and gets him in the shoulder. All right, now of course that gets infected. It gets infected, and now we've got Richard, who knows he's going to die, and he does this like this last noble act. He calls for the archer, the man that shot him, that caused his death, to be brought before him. And the archer is brought before him, and he's letting him know, I understand you were just doing your job. I know you were just doing your job, and I want you to know, even though he's, you know, the emperor, he's the king of this vast empire, um, that he has forgiven him, and he gives him money and sends him on his way. Right? Is that like amazingly incredible? Yeah. Chivalry. That's chivalry. Yes, yeah, so he does this very this very noble act and then shortly after that he, died. he dies and it's said that he died in his mother's arms. Now let me say this though that um, once he died, they went and got that guy they that him. shot him and they oh. and they flayed him. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So the poor guy, probably he got a little sack of money and, and went off very happily, not knowing what was, yeah. was about to happen to him. Yeah. So they, yeah. So they went and got him. And now we know King Richard as the most loved king of England throughout all history. Do you know? They have calculated that the total amount of time that Richard spent in England adds up to about six months. Six months. Oh, they, 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 oh, he's just, he's wonderful. He's, this is a statue of him, all right? That's a statue of him, uh, Westminster. Uh, but. I'm thinking that the people of England wished he hadn't done the last thing that he had done. All right, because the last thing that he had done was to name his brother John King of England. And when he named his brother John King of England, well, that just opened up a whole can of worms. A whole can of worms. And we're going to talk about that next week, all right? <laughs> next week, we're going to look at, um, perhaps you've never heard of this person. Have you ever heard of Arthur? Yes. No. Not, not the legendary Arthur. Oh, the regular this is, this is the prince, Arthur, Duke of Brittany. He is the son of Geoffrey. All right, now would the son of the third born 
inherit the throne before the fourth. Yes. 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 So what happened to Arthur? I'm going to tell you next week. All right? All right? Also, also next week, also next week, you've heard of this, right? Yes. Yes. Did you know that it was in direct response to the bad behavior of King John? All right, so we've got this incredible document and that affects us to this day, and it starts with King John. We've also got the story of his outrageous greed. It was terrible. Yes, and this uh, heavy, heavy, burdensome tax that he placed on all the people, which then introduces us to... Robin Hood. Robin Hood. <laughs> Amen. And we're going to talk about all of that next week. So we're going to go from England's most loved king to England's most... Hated king. Yes, to England's most hated king. All right, so we have all that to look forward to next time. All right, thanks for coming. I will see you next week.